the days of empire, the British started to grow concerned about the number of cobras within India. So the governors came up with a simple economic remedy. Why don't we just offer a bounty for cobra hides? And that policy was a hit, so much so, in fact, that enterprising Indians started to breed cobras just to get the bounty. Unsurprisingly, that caused a suspicious uptick in the number of bounties paid out. And finally, the Brits clocked on. They figured out what was happening, and they cancelled the scheme. Now, this posed a problem to the breeders. They now had all these worthless snakes. What are they going to do with them? And they chose to loose the surplus serpents back into the wild, causing the cobra population to surge beyond its previous levels, and, of course, completely defeating the point of the scheme. Almost every action we take introduces the risk of unintended consequences. Technology, of course, is no different. The cultural theorist Paul Virilio knew this well, saying, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. Every technology carries its own negativity, which is invented at the same time as technical progress. And oh boy, have we discovered these negativities in our field. We've served up countless examples recently of technology gone wrong. The press is as likely to call technology a danger today as it is a savior. Now, to be clear, these terrible mistakes were mostly not intentional. They were the result of unintended consequences. But that doesn't mean that our industry gets to escape blame for that. There may well have been no malice involved here, but there was plenty of negligence. And unless this changes, this is going to hamper the growth of our field. Over the next 10 to 20 years, the tech community is going to demand an enormous amount of trust from its users. We will ask people to connect more and more of their lives to the products and the services that we build. And the potential harms that come with emerging technology exceed even those with technology today. The stakes will only get higher with time. Algorithms could reinforce and cement bias in access to work, amenities, even justice. Surveillance systems could silently assemble the building blocks of totalitarianism. Automation could ravage the world of work, deepening inequality and upending our economies. So it's time that our industry took its ethical responsibilities seriously. And this has been my focus now for the last three years. So today I'd like to talk about what I've learned along that journey and how we as technologists can respond to the challenges ahead of us. Perhaps one of the most fundamental changes in perspective that we need to embrace is that technology isn't neutral, and in fact, it never was. Back in 1980, the philosopher Langdon Winner wrote an essay, uh, and a somewhat famous essay, called Do Artifacts Have Politics? And Winner's conclusion was essentially, yeah, damn right they do. And he gave the example of Robert Moses. Robert Moses, some of you may know, was the city planner uh, of New York, the chief architect of the city of New York, uh, in the middle, early part of last century. And Moses was a racist. We have plenty of evidence now of Moses' bigoted views. And Winner goes on to claim that Moses actually asserted his bigotry through design. Given the example here of bridges such as this one, which you see uh, a fairly low bridge built over a, a freeway leading to the beaches of Long Island. The point here being that Moses intentionally built these bridges so low that a bus would not be able to pass underneath. Uh, black residents of the city, minority uh, ethnic groups, tended at that time not to have access to private transport, and they had to travel by bus. So by designing these bridges intentionally so low that a bus couldn't get through, Moses was actually, at least Winner goes on to claim, Moses was intentionally racially segregating uh, large parts of the, of the city through design. So if something as inert as a bridge, you know, this hulking structure of a couple of hundred tons of concrete and steel, if that can have social and political and moral uh, impacts, then of course the technologies that we build today have to as well. These things that are full of light and language and energy. The world of technology is also, of course, the world of humans. It's a mistake to separate human capabilities from technical capabilities. These things act together. We're interwoven, hybridized actors. 
Moses' racist bridges show that things change what people can do and how we do it. So we have to abandon this idea that the things we build are neutral tools. We can't wash our hands of the social and ethical and political consequences of our work. Now, this can be a tough sell to some people. Technologies and algorithms and data, the building blocks of the things that we we, uh, operate every single day, it's easy to see those as clean and objective and, again, neutral concepts. But really, this isn't the case. Professor Jeffrey Bowker came up with this wonderful phrase, raw data is an oxymoron. All algorithms, all data, carry the biases of the people and the cultures that collect, process, and present that data. Here we see a fantastic graphic, uh, one of my favorite pieces of information design, by Simon Scar for the South China Morning Post. And Scar has chosen a very leading metaphor to depict the heavy cost of the Iraq conflict, this idea of dripping blood. I think it's, as I say, a really strong piece of design. It's laden with meaning and with connotation. But on the right-hand side, we see Andy Cockgrave from Tableau Software completely transforming the message of exactly the same raw data with just three shifts. He changes the headline of the graphic, he changes the color scheme, and he inverts it on the uh, vertical axis. I think this is elegant proof that we can introduce bias simply by the way that we structure, contextualize, and present exactly the same raw data. For me, design, and indeed any act of creation, is the application of ethics. It is applied ethics. Now, sometimes that relationship is obvious and explicit. If you're designing and manufacturing razor wire, Whether you realize it or not, you're making a very clear claim about the future. You're saying that essentially someone's right to private property is so important that we should injure someone who chooses to contravene that right. But even if you're not making something as morally laden as weapons or razor wire, all design, all making is making a statement about the future, how we should interact with technology in the years to come, and then, by extension, how we should interact with each other. And at the same time, we're discarding thousands of alternative futures. So for me, there's a clear ethical component when we're doing nothing less than making a claim for how we should all live. Now, in an ideal world, we want to get to a situation where ethics becomes an ethos, a way that we see the world around us and a way that we approach everything that we do. But I also recognize that our field, if we're going to achieve that kind of change, we have to take concrete steps. But I think, luckily, we have opportunities all through the product development process where we can have these kind of ethical interventions. Forgive the oversimplification of the product development process. We, of course, know that it's far messier than this. But right at the start, when we're defining the projects that we take on, we're defining and analyzing the markets that we build for, we can set ourselves a proper ethical foundation for our work. Perhaps the most important thing we have to do here is to reconsider who we think of as a stakeholder for our work. Now, if you open up any MBA textbook, They will talk about stakeholder analysis. And usually they'll refer to people who can affect the project. They might be peers in in your organization. They might be your superiors. They might be partners. They might be regulators. Um, But generally, they're going to be people in suits, right? people who can affect what you're about to do. But of course, there's a second category of stakeholder, people who can be affected by the work that we're about to do. And these people have sadly been overlooked for too long in our work. Airbnb, for example, is a very well-designed product for precisely two groups of users, people who have spare property they want to earn money off, and then people who want to rent that property. But all the costs, the externalities, as they're called, of that system fall not on those two groups, but on local neighborhoods. If you live next door to an Airbnb property, you no longer have a neighbor, right? You have a new neighbor every couple of days, all of them dragging their wheelie suitcases along the cobbles at 4 a.m. They're not going to spend their money locally. They'll spend it at the tourist traps. They're not going to help develop um, a local neighborhood culture. Um, And of course, in the meantime, property prices are pushed up by the revenue potential of these 
uh, of these uh, properties. And this is partly as a result of our laser-like focus on the user, which has made plenty of sense for the previous wave of technology to get efficient technology into people's hands. But it's also caused us to become narrow and individualistic. We're focusing too much just on user needs and not enough on society's needs. We may even need to abstract further and say there are certain values, certain concepts that we hold dear as a society that we also need to find a way to protect. If you work, say, for Facebook, then there's probably a, a good claim that some of the work your colleagues have been creating has started to threaten the fabric of democracy or the freedom of the press. These are things we need to start to consider explicitly within our product development life cycle. One way we can start to tease out those kind of questions is to create what I call a persona non grata. I'm sure many of you know the idea of a design persona where you get you know, someone, give them a name and a face, and you put them up on the walls, and you talk about their goals and how you can help create a system that fulfills those goals. Well, this is essentially a kind of a persona noir, if you like, flipping that around. Maybe it's a hacker or a troll or a terrorist. Um, obviously, security teams sometimes have this pivot in thinking, but we can apply that to a broader product development process. So we give these people the full persona treatment. We talk about their goals, their motivations. We give them a face and a name. And then our job becomes to hamper these individuals, to stop them misusing and abusing the systems that we create. But exposing them is a really important part of that process to help treat that problem. When we come to the idea generation phase, we're starting to look at how we might start to tackle a particular problem. We can build on that initial ethical foundation and introduce uh, a couple of new techniques. When I talk about unintended consequences, I, I feel I need to be clear that unintended consequences are not the same thing as unforeseeable consequences. There are actually ways that we can try to tease out the second and third order impacts of our work. Now, if you talk to a professional ethicist about this, he or she might talk about moral imagination, as they call it. The idea that you need to anticipate what might happen next and then essentially look at the ethical impact of that. But that's kind of abstract, right? It's a thought experiment. It doesn't feel as concrete as it might be. So I think that kind of thing is easier to do if you have a prompt. And so I like to borrow from the field of what's called speculative design and create something that I call a provocotype. This is something that really needs an example. So let me walk you through this one. This is by Marcel Schoenar and Harm van Beek. Um, and it's created for two uh, Dutch energy clients. And the scenario, the brief that these designers were given was essentially to look at what might public uh, vehicle charging infrastructure look like um, in 10, 20 years in, a, in an era of scarce energy resources. And so they built this thing. It's, a, you know, it's two meters tall. It's a pretty sizable um, prototype. Um, but let me walk you through how it works from the bottom. So right at the, right at the foot here, they've actually got charging cables, electric vehicle charging cables that they've taken from somewhere and they've got them in the prototype. So you pick one up and you plug it in in the socket at the bottom. The little LEDs light up to show you which color you are within the system. You're red, you're blue. So you kind of ID yourself through that. Above that, we have RFID readers. So we take a card that authenticates us with the system, we tap it, and it knows, therefore, who we are. Above that, we have some dials. And we can use these dials to essentially set our request, to say, well, I want, let's say I just need a quick top up, because I've got an urgent errand, I just need 10 minutes of charge, and then I'm on my way. Or maybe saying, actually, I need a full charge, but I realize I'm probably going to have to wait longer, because there are people ahead of me in that queue. So we use these dials to set that request. And then above it, the display, the sort of dot matrix-like display, is the algorithmic decision of how do we allocate energy? Who gets what when? And it starts at the bottom, so you see blue and red have a little bit of charge each. Uh, and you'll notice that it starts to change, right? We get almost a different energy bandwidth, a very small amount and a larger amount and so on, because the system can predict this is how much energy we think we'll have in six hours' time, 12 hours' time. So we'll see that red and green are getting, uh, red and blue rather, are getting a little bit now, then blue gets their turn, and then finally green gets their full charge. So this is an interesting uh, 
prototype provocotype because it helps to expose what an algorithmically driven world might look like in practice in 10 to 20 years. But the most interesting thing for me is that the designers didn't stop there. They actually prototyped the RFID cards, the, uh, the cards that we're using to allocate different social status and different energy status. So in the middle, we see a card for a doctor. Perhaps this is something that's um, you know, given, given to doctors. But there's a caveat, right? You have top priority in the system, but if you abuse it, you know, it might be punishable by, by law. You have to use it with discretion. Below that, we have a probation ID. Maybe this is a card that we give to uh, a recent offender or someone uh, you know, awaiting trial. And they have low priority within the system. Uh, they have capped usage and so on. So we can see here with a prototype and with these cards, the potential for the Internet of Things and for energy scarcity to come together in ways that actually encode and reinforce social status and even inequality. Now, the designers aren't saying this is the best solution. Right? They're not going to their energy clients and say, you need to start installing these right now across Utrecht and Rotterdam and so on. Instead, they've created the design that gets the right conversations happening that expose some of the moral implications of the technologies we could build so that we have a proper way to talk about them. Rather than some abstract thought experiment of, well, what might we do? We now have an object or two that allows that conversation to really kick off. To take advantage of ethics, though, at this stage, we also have to change how we think about ethics. It's very easy to see it as a drag, as something that's you know, going to hamper innovation. It's going to slow down our processes. But I like the phrasing from Peter Paul Verbeek. He's a philosopher of technology, also in the Netherlands, as it happens. And he points out that ethics doesn't always have to oppose technology and innovation, but it just needs to accompany it. It should go alongside it. So it's about taking ethics and infusing it into our work, seeing it as a constraint. Now, if you talk to a designer about constraints, they see constraints differently than a lot of other folk do. A designer knows that constraints don't necessarily mean you have fewer options. Now, certainly it will mean that some options aren't viable, but it also generates new options, having that additional constraint in place. So ethics can be a positive force. It can be a constructive force. I think ethics can be a seed of innovation, not just a pair of shears snipping off the undesirable branches. When we come to the design phase proper, uh, we have to start challenging some preconceptions that maybe we've taken for granted too long as a field. A lot of the ethical dangers of technology stem from invisibility. People simply don't know what's happening inside their devices, their hubs, and so on. And again, I think designers probably have to take some of the blame for that. I'm a designer by trade, so I hopefully can say that. But we've had these mantras of simplicity, uh, you know, try to minimize friction in our interfaces. And we've treated things like data flows as complexity, something that the user really has no business understanding. We've trained people not to lift the hood of their technologies and, and tinker with what's inside. So we have to change that. We have to find a way to bring these things that have previously, previously been invisible and bring them back into the light by making them material, by bringing them into that visible spectrum. Perhaps the best example of this that I can think of in, in current technology is something like this, the uh, energy monitors you find in hybrid vehicles. This is from the Prius. I think it's quite an old, old version. But what I love about this is it gives insight into something that was previously invisible. We, you know, we've had no idea how energy flows through a car. Um, well, we may have had an abstract concept, but we certainly haven't had it on our dashboards. But by giving insight into this complex system, you can learn how your driving style changes what's happening in the car. So I learn when I'm accelerating too quickly away from lights, uh, and therefore I can see, well, if I do that, then it's going to start draining from uh, the engine rather than from the battery. So I can change my style to try and preserve the, you know, the mileage, uh, the, the efficiency of the vehicle. So by materializing, by showing something that was previously hidden, people can now act in more sustainable and ethical ways. 
So could we apply these principles to digital technologies, say something like home automation? So this is my speculative, again, speculative design for some kind of home hub. You know the sort of thing it's starting to emerge now. I think Google have just announced a, a, a Nest home hub a bit like this. And let's say it's connecting your home technologies, your, um, you know, your, your smart thermometers, your thermostats, you know, this sort of stuff. And maybe it has access to wearables or to your handsets. And there's some kind of deal where maybe you get this device for free in exchange for yielding some data to that system. Now, at the moment, systems like that are almost completely opaque. Uh, people don't know the data flows that are happening, what's going in and out of these systems, what's linked to what, and what decisions are taken. But we could potentially create some dashboard, some materialization of those decisions in something like this. What excites me about this is the potential for the user to actually intervene. If they see something they don't like, if this is, say, a touch screen, you say, actually, I don't think you ought to have my heart rate here. I can swipe and pluck that out and, and so on. And so this gets us closer to the idea of a truly trusted technology where there's informed consent. People know exactly the um, exchanges that they're entering into. What am I giving up? What am I getting in return? Something that sadly is, is way too far off today. Another design principle that we sometimes hear is this concept of don't make me think. Many of you will know that's the title of Steve Krug's uh, best-selling book. And of course, yes, that is often true. We generally want to reduce friction in our technologies. But the downside of that is it takes power away. It takes agency away from the end user sometimes. So just sometimes, that's actually a principle that I think we need to flip. Sometimes we should make the user think. We need to increase the friction in our interfaces. Let's say we have the same smart home hub. Uh, this might be a way that we design that interaction to increase the friction of, uh, so that people know what's happening inside this, um, this technology. Let's say we're asking for this kind of data, biometrics, location. It's pretty sensitive stuff. Um, we also, I think, have a duty to inform people that Data, even if it's anonymized, there's always a risk it could get re-identified. Uh, re we have different data sets, different algorithms to unpick that uh, anonymization, essentially. So I'm saying here, let's actually increase the friction here. Classical usability would say, well, you just need a big green button saying OK and then a small thing saying cancel. I'm saying, no, let's make it hard. I'm, I'm going to ask the user to get out a stylus or to use their hand and write the word I agree in this box. Now, this is definitely more hassle. This will definitely hurt metrics. You will find less conversion through a flow like this. But the people who do make it through are trusting you far, far more. You're building genuine, true consent, a knowledge of the value exchange that's happening between the user and the tech company. And so it builds trust. It reduces the risk of this being rejected later, uh, later on. It reduces the risk of lawsuits, of punitive regulation all these sorts of things, we're trying to mitigate some of those risks with design like this. Another technique that we can consider at this stage is what's called the veil of ignorance. This is something that comes from John Rawls, a philosopher who wrote a book called A Theory of Justice. The idea of the veil of ignorance is hopefully a fairly simple one. Essentially, a fair system is one designed as if we don't know where we'll end up in that system. So let's say I'm designing a welfare program. According to this veil of ignorance, a fair system is one where wherever I end up, if I'm uh, an administrator of the scheme, if I'm a welfare recipient, if I'm a taxpayer, then I look at that program and I think, yeah, that seems about right from my perspective. Really, it's about agreeing the rules of the game before you deal the hands. So this involves stepping into the shoes of each of these stakeholders that we talked about saying how can they affect the work and how are they affected by it? How do they see it? Designers, as you'll know, spend a lot of time on critique. Critique, I think, is such an important part of the ethical product development process. And it might be the easiest place to start because we have hundreds of years of ethical thoughts that we can draw in to these conversations. One technique is adopting what's called the designated dissenter. This is an idea that I first heard about in Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachtebecher's book, Design for Real Life. The designated dissenter is 
the best way I can describe it is they're kind of a constructive pain in the ass. They're there to role play as someone who's going to challenge the team's assumptions. They'll throw in these little grenades of defiance into uh, the product development process. So if someone, say, um, asking for you know, sensitive data, marital status, for example, a designated dissenter might role play as someone going through a difficult divorce and say, well, why are you asking me for this stuff? I don't want to have to think about this right now. I'm just trying to sign up to register this credit card or whatever it is. But at this stage, we also have to ask searching questions. We have to get beyond the kind of hunches that a lot of us operate by when it comes to morality. We need to have a more rigorous way to talk about ethics. So we can rely here upon what I call four ethical tests derived from three main schools of ethical thinking. And we'll just go quickly through them now. The first test we can offer, what if everyone did what I'm about to do? Would a world in which this was a universal law of behavior, would that be a better place or a worse place. This idea comes from Immanuel Kant. It's called a deontological theory of ethics. But let's run through a quick example. If I'm being asked to code up a dark pattern, um, we all know dark patterns, right? Deceptive interfaces designed to sort of hoodwink users into behaving certain ways that benefit us. If I've got someone, I don't want to throw product managers under the bus, but it's probably a PM, saying, I want you to ship this dark pattern. Say we've got a renew flag for a you know, a subscription, I want you to set that to on uh, by default. Well, what if everyone did what I'm about to do? Well, it's pretty clear, I think, if everyone shipped every dark pattern that they could or that they were asked to do, well, of course, the sphere of technology is diminished. We, the whole general public would trust technology less. They would trust their devices less. So this question at least gives us some ammunition to say, I'm not sure this is an ethically appropriate thing to do. Another question we can ask also comes from Immanuel Kant. Am I treating people as ends or as means? Now, this maybe takes a bit of unpacking. For me, this is about, am I treating users particularly as free individuals with their own goals in life, or am I really just treating them as ways for me to hit my own uh, goals? Now, this isn't a question that I think any one of us would struggle with individually. It's clearly not right to use people in that way. But when you start to get enough people like us in a larger company, then particularly a data-driven company, the framing of users starts to shift over time. They become not the reason we're there. They become experimental subjects. They become means for us to hit our OKRs, our targets, or whatever it is. Essentially, the framing shifts so that we see people not as people, but as masses. And when that happens, unethical design is almost certainly around the corner. Another ethical test that we can apply, am I maximizing happiness for the greatest number of people? And then by extension, minimizing suffering, of course. This is what's known as a utilitarian perspective on ethics. And these folks, they're not interested so much in having certain rules in the same way a deontologist is. They're much more interested in the impact, the consequences of a decision. And I think this can be quite a useful uh, perspective for technologists to take because it feels a bit measurable, right? If we had some way to calculate the actual effect on a society, um, then we could just create some kind of moral equation, moral calculus, it's sometimes called, and plug these values in and see what happens. And then we could have some basis for making those ethical decisions. And then the fourth ethical test that I'll uh, share here is, would I be happy for this to be a front page story? By extension, would I be happy for it to go into a WhatsApp group or a push notification sent to all my family and friends? And this is grounded in what's called virtue ethics. This is the third main pillar of, of modern ethics. And virtue ethicists aren't interested in rules so much. They're not really that interested in consequences, in outcomes. They care about moral character, about what's inside, about the values and the virtues that we choose to live by as individuals. So really, this is a question about accountability. Right? Would I be happy to sign my name to the decision that I'm about to take? And so it speaks to our identity. It speaks to who we are as people. So that's hopefully a very important point of, of moral reasoning. And finally, of course, we should take time to test whether the assumptions we've made are actually correct, whether the impacts of our technologies are as positive as we hope they are. 
And there are ways we can do this on a quantitative basis. Uh, Kate Crawford talks about fairness forensics, essentially a set of uh, techniques to analyze, say, machine learning systems, analyze training data for bias, to audit algorithms, to see whether their results are fair, and so on. I think these are really good starting points. But of course, quantitative techniques are almost always best when they're paired with qualitative techniques. So this is where things like field research really come in. We can see, then, the potential effects of our choices among a wide range of people. We're talking about a designated dissenter. Who better to act as that dissenter than someone who has every cause to dissent? So we should get people testing our betas, our provocotypes, get them in early before the harms of our decisions actually go live into the wider public. Sadly, because of the way that technologies and humans uh, sort of work together and interact, the harms of technology most often fall upon society's most vulnerable people. So we need to understand those communities better. We need to bring their representatives and their activists into the studio, into the tech company, so we can understand and build our technologies around them. Underpinning all of this, we should build what I call ethical infrastructure, essentially building our resilience, our capabilities to make better ethical decisions. Hiring diverse teams is an obvious way to do that. Uh, if we have a group of people who are all the same, then of course they won't be wise to the potential consequences for a wider group of people. If you're lucky enough to manage a team, to be a leader, you have an opportunity to set the expectations. How should people behave? So you're saying not just rewarding results, but rewarding the right behaviors. And if you do that, you typically get the results for free. And then building things like core values. Core values sometimes get a bit of stick. Um, but when they're very well done, when they're truly well defined and adopted by an entire company, these become great ethical tiebreakers. They become uh, a way for us to solve these tricky quandaries because we have written down as a company the ways that we want to behave. Now, some of these questions do get perhaps a little bit political, and tech workers are finally starting to recognize that they are getting involved, whether they like it or not, in the politics of their work. Individually, we may be quite weak, but collectively, technologists are strong. Designers, product managers, software engineers um, are expensive, hard to replace, and if we lift our hands off the keyboards, of course, nothing gets built. So the tech industry is getting politically targeted now by both wings. Uh, of the political spectrum. Regulation is only going to increase. So we should get involved in that process. No one, even the most pedantic bureaucrat, wants bad regulation. So we should get involved with that process, with consultations, trying to guide representatives, steer them toward more appropriate solutions. But ultimately, that change has to come through practice rather than theory. Ethics is really a muscle that needs exercise. The choice to live well is just that. It's a choice. It's not some abstract gift that some people have. So we have to ask ourselves difficult questions. How might I be screwing up right now in the work I'm doing? What would my limit be? When would I know? And how would I have that conversation when someone's asking me to do something that I consider to be unethical? Now, asking those questions can be a bit risky, so I recognize that there's some privilege in that. Not everyone has the circumstances to be able to take those kind of risks. But I will say this, if you feel comfortable and safe and respected in your company, in your career, then you're in exactly the right position to use up just a bit of that goodwill to stand up for what you think is morally right. Now, that can be difficult and emotionally draining work. It becomes easy to punish yourself for your own inconsistencies. But what I choose to cling to is that by doing this, you actually take a step closer to being the kind of person that you really want to be. But it does mean we have to draw upon each other. Given the challenges of the future, we're going to need all the thoughtful technologists that we can get, people who care enough to make a difference in this crucial industry of ours and who want to help navigate it toward a better future. And I dearly hope that you will be one of those people. Thanks for your time.